You're listening to Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for firm faith in an anxious age. I'm your host, Colin Hansen. If Eric Larson writes the book, I read the book. It's one of my simple rules of life. All the more so when he writes about one of the most dramatic periods of history, the so-called London Blitz of 1940 and 1941, when Great Britain withstood aerial bombardment by Nazi Germany. Larson's latest book is The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill, family, and defiance during the Blitz, published by Crown. Larson is also the number one New York Times bestselling author of two of my most memorable reads, The Devil in the White City, and also Dead Wake, among other titles. If you're looking for an engrossing read during the coronavirus quarantine, I recommend this book. You'll be engrossed in the life and death struggle of a nation and its dynamic leader in their confrontation with Nazi tyranny. I read the book before the world stopped spinning, but recent events gave me a new perspective on the timeliness of this work, and it even made me wonder about the role of religion or lack thereof in this and in that previous crisis. So that's why I've invited Eric Larson to speak with me on Gospel Bound. I'm glad he agreed. Thank you for joining me, Eric. Thank you for having me. Uh, When did you decide, Eric, to undertake this project? I mean, I know uh, there just has to be an incredible amount of time and energy that's devoted into a book of this detail. So, you know, when did you decide to do that and and what drew you to this particular place and time? Yeah, excuse me. Well, the conception uh, was probably about, honestly, about five years ago now. Um, That's not to say I've been working on it solid for five full years, but and it happened when my wife and I moved from uh, Seattle, where we'd been living with our our three daughters. We moved from Seattle to Manhattan. The kids had grown up and left the house, and it was getting awfully quiet around there. So we decided that now we're going to move to New York. Uh, It's where I'd always wanted to wanted to live. And so we did so. And as soon as we arrived, um, I, I had this kind of epiphany about the nature of 9-11. Um, you know, we had seen that unfold on, in real time on, on CNN from our home in Seattle. But arriving in New York, um, I, I, I realized how, how the experience of New Yorkers was an order of magnitude more vivid and wrenching than we, what we had experienced. Because, you know, they could not only hear uh, the sirens, see the smoke and drifting ash and so forth, but there was also that sense of violation of their home city. Their hometown was attacked. And I started thinking, one, you know, one thought led to another. I started thinking about the Blitz, which I've always kind of been intrigued by, and how on earth people could have survived that when you know, the first phase of the Blitz, um, London underwent 57 consecutive nights of bombing, if you will, 57 consecutive 9-11s, um, followed by six months uh, of, of intensifying bombings, but at larger, larger, at longer intervals. Um, and so I, I started thinking about that, and I started thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to try to get at that concept through a book? What was that like? Um, maybe uh, at first I was thinking about uh, maybe uh, lo- locating a, in the records a typical London family and chronicling their experience. Um, and I thought, well, why not? Why not take a look at the quintessential London family, Churchill, um, his family, his his advisors? I mean, how on earth did they get through this when they also had to, you know, Churchill and his advisors, they also had to run their half of a world war? Hmm. It seems odd to say this, but we remember the Blitz fondly. I mean, when you're imagining the death toll and the physical destruction, but in our minds, it's this incredibly heroic and like civilization saving time. But what we don't remember is what you're describing here, the hardship. And you write about the difficulty, and this includes the Churchill family themselves. I was struck by how they had to be so worried about a a single German bomber just sending upon their home outside of the city because it was so clearly marked and everybody knew about that through intelligence and and things like that. But Another thing that stood out to me was how you write about how difficult it was to endure the bombing at night and then work during the day. What was it that just stood out with you as you read about how Londoners coped with this long term disaster? Well, what I I was really struck by is the fact that um, 
Well, for, first, it's important to, to describe a little bit about how the, how the, uh, the bombing of London um, evolved. The, the initial part of the German air campaign in 1940-41 in 1940 was sort of almost an, an aimless um, testing of defenses and technologies and so forth. Um, and then more focused attacks on the, on the British aircraft industry. But only on September 7, 1940, did the actual deliberate bombing of London begin. And this began um, actually by first by uh, by, by day at tea time actually, um, and then lasted through throughout throughout the night. Um, during the day, um, as as it became clear that the Germans had shifted all their operations to nighttime bombing, um, you know people went about their lives in, in a very ordinary fashion. You know, they commuted to work. Sometimes it took a little longer if a bomb had blown up their train station or if bomb had landed on their, the tracks of their right of way. But they went to work as usual. They came with their gas masks. That was a little bit different, but they brought those to work as well. And then they left work um, uh, early, um, uh, depending on the, the season, uh, so that they could get back in time for blackout. Where they black out all their windows and then hunker down however they felt it was best to do it. Some went to public shelters. Some, uh, some just stayed in there stayed in their bedrooms or some went down to their basements and some into their, their garden shelters. It is, by the way, something of a myth that, that yeah, I, I think people tend to think that in, in, in London, everybody, everybody uh, fled to the tube stations, the subway stations, but that proves not to be the case. A relatively small percentage of Londoners went into the subways. Yeah, what, is, what did you find in some of the memoirs of just how they held up? under this. I mean, I, I, that's why I'm wondering for our own situation, no matter how long this might last, what did you learn about human nature and our ability to be able to adjust to our circumstances? Well, they adapted pretty well. <laughs> you know, um, well, what I was kind of, uh, kind of leading up to was that, you know, not only by day did they have ordinary lot, lead their ordinary lives, but even at night, um, uh, bars were open, restaurants were open. That's one difference between now and and then, I mean, you know, it's something that we're all going to be missing, at least here in New York for a while. But, the, you know, bars were open, restaurants were open, clubs were open, people were dancing, they had parties, you know, and, and they kind of developed this fatalistic approach to, to life. And that is that, you know, the bomb's going to get you. It's going to get you. And if it doesn't, you know, you're, you're good to go out and dance again. Um, so, so it was a very sort of, um, uh, Londoners really adapted very well to, to the crisis. But I think, but I think there was a progression. You know, I, I, one of my favorite characters in the book, characters as in real nonfiction characters, uh, was a, a young woman named Olivia Cockett, who was a diarist uh, for uh, an organization called Mass Observation, uh, which had recruited hundreds of ordinary Londoners to keep diaries even before the war. And her diary um, sketches a very interesting progression. She goes from she goes from terrified after the September 7th, 1940 bombing, um, to one day putting out an incendiary bomb that landed outside her house. Incendiary bombs were what the Germans dropped first so that they would set fire to things, and these fires would then, would then serve as beacons to the aircraft that would, would follow other, other bombers. So she puts one of these things out. She, she, she manages to, to, to snuff it out, which is what people were asked to do if they saw an incendiary land somewhere. And she was so elated at being able to do this, at no longer being a passive victim, that she just became absolutely emboldened. Her life, her life really, really changed. She became much, much more courageous. Let's go back to Churchill. And he might not have been the right leader for Great Britain in every time. I think a lot of people don't recall that um, Great Britain actually voted him out of office before the war even ended, um, the part at least against Japan. But certainly he was the right leader for the right time in the Blitz. What can we learn from his leadership under that kind of strain? Yeah, he was, um, I, 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 I've thought quite a bit about this, and especially now, actually, in, in, in terms of the situation we're going through. What characterized Churchill was, first of all, he, he, he was a courageous man, you know, fearless. Um, and, and he managed to communicate that, that fearlessness. But above all, he had a real grasp of the power of symbolic acts, that the things that he did, how he behaved would be communicated to, 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 to the world around him. Also, he, he, you know, he's known, of course, for his 
for his, um, his speeches. But when you take a look at those speeches, there's, there's, there's a pattern. Um, he, was, um, he was very direct. He did not try to sugarcoat things. He told things as they were. But then he would provide actual realistic grounds for optimism. You know, not some happy talk, but just having said that, you know, now we 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 just recognize that we've got this and we've got this, and, and, and we're working on this this, you know, trying to trying to uh, to you know uh, stave off invasion by the Germans, and we're going to get through this. We are going to survive this. Um, and and so and then he would end these speeches after after this recitation of fact. And optimism, he would invariably end on an ascending note with this oratorical flourish that was like virtually set people up off their chairs and, and, and sent them out into the streets being, you know, brave once again. I would describe it as a kind of sober hope. Uh, and that really stood out to me in the book as very much, well. Very, but... much so, very much so. It was, it, it, he, he managed to convey um, a, 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 a sober hope, a sense of hope that was grounded in, in the gravity of the real situation people were in. Have you ever come across another leader who had that particular kind of ability? I mean, you really identify that as the genius of his leadership, the ability to be able to be straightforward and truthful and at the same time, be hopeful. Those are hard things to manage. Very hard things to manage. You know, I, I think that you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on the world's leaders, but you know, honestly, I think that I think that Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt has had some of those characteristics. You know, uh, that that famous um, uh, remark of his that you know we have nothing to fear but fear itself, which is a very powerful, very powerful, powerful thing, and, and it has, you know, I, I believe is applicable today. Um, you know, Churchill, um, Churchill said something uh, uh, wonderful in one of his very early speeches saying, you know, it'd be foolish to ignore the gravity, gravity of the hour, but equally foolish um, uh, to, lose, to lose hope and courage. Now, Churchill was certainly an active figure there, but most people were really passive. They didn't have an ability to necessarily shape world events the way that Churchill did and be able to muster all of that, um, all of that courage. And one of the things you see, at least with the pattern, if we broaden out from the Blitz a little bit, is this um, situation where Britain prepares for another war that they did not want. Then you have a year of this phony war uh, where there aren't attacks, even though they're expected. Then you get, of course, the the sudden fall of France, the unexpected fall of France, then the air raids. Of course, on top of the air raids, you have the possibility of invasion by paratroopers at any point in time. I just can't imagine the fear and anxiety that they must have experienced with that sense of foreboding, um, just not knowing the future. Did you find anything in diaries or memoirs or observations of that time that helped help people to, or that gave you an understanding of how people prepare when they just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? Yeah. You know, I, I again, I, I think things followed a, something of a, of a progression for people that first, first came terror. Um, and, you know, a lot of people actually simply left, left London uh, and then actually many came back. But first there, first there was terror. There's also this fear of the unknown. What was really going to happen? Was there going to be this, this invasion by Germany, but you know, over over time, and I'm not really quite sure what the dynamic is. Maybe it's simply people get worn down by by fear, and it's like, no, no, forget about it. You know, I'm just gonna just gonna lead my life, and, and whatever comes, you know, whatever comes comes. Um, you know, because it was a truism um, uh, that at the time that you know when when the, the German bombing campaign was at its most intense over over. Uh, London. It was the case that, you know, no one person, you could not point to any one person on the street and say that person is going to die tonight. Um, but you you knew beyond doubt that someone in London was going to die that night. And there's something at first terrifying, but also something liberating in that idea that you can't you have no control. You have no ability to determine whether you're going to get blown up by this bomb or not. Um, it's a it's a it's a very frightening thing. Now you know parallels today. I mean, we've got this this virus that we can't see, and we don't know who's bringing it into our homes and who's got it in the stores. So in that respect, you know, there's a certain similarity to the idea of a bomb falling from nowhere. But it gets a lot it gets a lot trickier now. You know, with this because you know, we're talking about not a not a visible uh, uh, not a visible entity across the channel that you know we're, we're 
they're able to confront this this, this sort of pathogen, which really adds to the to the anxiety. Um, but I think we're going to follow a similar pattern. You know, I think that um, I think people are going to realize as the situation stabilizes. And that's part of that's part of the problem now. Is the situation is not stable. Every day there's some new thing, and we're all like, well, what's going to happen next? Nobody knows. Um, uh, so once things clarify, I think the people will be able to, to stick their courage to the sticking place and, and rise up. Yeah, I think even if we found out that we're going to be in this for eight weeks or we're going to be in this for two, you know, for three months or something like that, at least the certainty or the timeline would be helpful there. But again, the smartest people aren't able to figure that out yet. And we, we yeah. pray and we urge them on in that process of, yeah. of learning. Um, you know, you're, um, your books are dealing with so many different points of crises and how people react in that in that crisis. And I would imagine with all of your immersion in writing about this and narrating in this and researching and studying, you must identify some characteristics of human nature that that span the different books that you've written. So can you identify any of those threads about who we are as as human beings that that transcend the different um, crises that we face? Well, you know, I think uh, I think fundamentally, um, uh, courage and intelligence trumps all. Um, you know, um, if you have the capacity to look at the world in a, in a rational way and, and to convey that sense of of, uh, of the world to to others, I think that's a very 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 powerful thing. Um, you know, I think honestly, one thing that's very much missing today with regard to the, the uh, COVID nineteen virus is that um, we haven't had that. We haven't had that 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 Churchillian leadership yet. No, I I agree, and it's it's something that I keep waiting to emerge, and perhaps. We're in sort of the 1939 phase here where we have like Chamberlain leadership. And by the way, I'm not speaking necessarily about just identifying on one individual as a president. I'm speaking just very broadly in terms of yep. our society's leadership there. And for people who are listening to this podcast, especially and are following the Gospel Coalition website, they're looking at that from a religious perspective and a Christian sure. perspective in particular. And Churchill is he was not a devout man. Uh, interestingly, he is a pretty constant fascination of many Christians, but again, was not himself devout or practicing. And religion is not a major theme of your book either. By contrast, American leaders at least have typically pretended to be religious, even if they aren't. But one of the things I've noticed in this current situation is that when President Trump brings people to give comfort and assurance. He brings business leaders and he brings scientists. And I'm not against that. I just think it's interesting that he hasn't really brought religious leaders forward. And I'm not even sure many people have noticed that he hasn't brought religious leaders forward. And that's also a pretty significant contrast to earlier periods of history, 9-11 being an example of that. But I'm wondering, as you were reading about the Blitz, whether it was Churchill or others, did you discern any particular religious themes or religious messages in response? Or was it likewise somewhat devoid of that kind of um, sort of transcendent perspective? Well, for, first, uh, let me just address that in terms of in terms of Churchill. Um, yeah, he, he, was, he was definitely not devout. He was not a religious man. Uh, church near the uh, prime ministerial uh, country retreat checkers um, uh, he attended one time <laughs> in, in, in his in his um, premiership but you know the thing the thing to remember about churchill is that while he was not a devout man he was not a religious man per se he did have um, a, 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 a moral core he, he did have a moral core he was a he was a deeply moral caring, thoughtful man. And, and, and that's, that's a, a fundamental element, you know. Um, now, among the populace, um, there was, of course, a, a good deal of, of, uh, of uh, trying, to, trying to find solace um, in churches, trying to find solace from religious leaders, National Day of Prayer, and so forth. But that was not Churchill. That was not Churchill, although he did invoke God in his speeches. But Churchill, 
Churchill, you know, was was sort of the the, 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 the rational statesman with this tremendously tremendously um, uh, uh, diverse range of traits. Among them, this 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 rich moral core that allowed him to see the world and to feel for for all the people who were hurting in that world. Yeah, I think that's a good um, that's a good point there, and I'm wondering if we're able to even muster that kind of moral core now. And because Churchill was, while not a devout man himself, he was very much shaped, and I know my timeline's a little bit off here, but he's very much shaped by Victorian England, yeah. a time of very public religiosity in many ways, or at least I should say it was a very highly moral time, even across theological differences. It was still very much concerned with that kind of moral core. Um, and you're right, that comes through very clear, and it gave Churchill that ability to be able to identify before many others had those essential evils of Nazism. Uh, but sure. I do wonder <clears throat> what that looks like today at a time when morality has been subsumed. And I'm not just talking about like amorality. I'm saying it's not really the category that we use so much anymore. We're, we're thinking in terms of, um, well, I had saw somebody joke that if we know that the aliens are coming, the first thing we're going to do is lower the interest rates. Yeah. <laughs> like, like that's our instinct is to turn yeah. economic. And I would even think about 9-11, the response there, which is part of why this is so disorienting is because the response to 9-11 was get out there and shop. Yeah. 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 Get out there and spend your money. And so I, I'm, I'm not trying to make a kind of a narrow point here, but a broader one about what are the shared moral values that we could muster yeah at a time like this. And um, I guess we're still going to have well, to wait to see how that emerges. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think, I think I, uh, first of all, one has to be careful with the word morality because it means so much to us today that it didn't right. necessarily mean mean back in, the, in, in, in Churchill's day. But again, I just have to come back to the fact that, <clears throat> that Churchill was this, this, this tremendous blend of, 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 of skilled orator, rational thinker, um, who also had deep compassion for his fellow man and was able to marshal all that into his approach to, to this, this, this terrible chaotic situation. Um, I would love to see somebody step forward now who could do the same thing in, in America. It definitely hasn't happened, certainly not from the White House. Um, but, you know, maybe give it time, uh, depending on how things, how things evolve. Right. Well, absolutely. Um, I had a chance to meet you once. You swung through Birmingham um, at yeah. uh, one of these book events, and and I really appreciated a, a moment just to be able to talk with you about some of your favorite authors. And I, I think that can be helpful when you're talking to somebody who's accomplished as you are. Writers are also readers. Uh, so I'm just wondering, what authors do you do you especially respect, or if, if they're producing something, you want to go out there and read that? I'm, I'm thinking especially narrative nonfiction, but... Really, I'm kind of looking for anything that people could read during this unusual time of quarantine. Yeah, well, you know, uh, you know, it, it, uh, whatever whatever I told you back when we chatted in Birmingham is probably you know 100 different now. I mean, I, uh, my favorite writers vary by by hour and by day. But you know, I mean, addressing first the idea of narrative nonfiction, I think that's an interesting realm in which to to perhaps lose oneself in a time of trouble. Um, um, you know, I, I, things I'd recommend, I mean, like, like uh, 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 Candace Millard, uh, uh, who wrote a tremendous book about, uh, actually about Churchill, the young Churchill called The Hero of the Empire. Um, I think that um, uh, David McCulloch is, is a terrific, uh, a terrific uh, uh, writer of, of narrative nonfiction, and his book, Mornings on Horseback about the young Teddy Roosevelt would be, I think, a terrific book for, for anybody interested in narrative nonfiction to read during, during this particular time. Roosevelt reminds me a lot of, uh, of Churchill there as well. Kind of, I think in some ways, about as close as we get in America, though, without having been through Te that you kind of major... Te Te yeah, Te Teddy Roosevelt. Te yeah, I mean, Te FDR, I mean... I mean, of course, FDR and, and Winston Churchill worked well together. Yes. But I think in terms of similarity, I would go with the cousin, Teddy, yeah. in terms of uh, similarity to Winston there. Right. Right. Um, and especially with that with that essential moral core right. um, there, both of them are similar in that regard. Okay, so last question I have on this, um, on this podcast, I like to ask people for their snap reaction 
What's the last great book you read? A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that. It's a great book because, um, and actually a good book, I think, for this for this time, uh, truly. Um, the book is about um, a, um, uh, a, a count, uh, Count Rostov, um, who is sentenced by Soviet authorities to spend uh, the rest of his life incarcerated in a hotel in Moscow. Very interesting setup. And, and you know, uh, far from falling into despair, the man goes on to craft this very compelling life, uh, surrounded by compelling and quirky characters who, who enter from from all corners of of, 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 of of the hotel and the city. Um, it's really a very charming thing. And what what happens in that book that I think is is is, is so spectacular. It's something that every writer strives for, and very few of us ever achieve. And that is that the resulting work is achieves a level of magic beyond the individual words on the page. And that's what happens with Joan in Moscow. You are transported and, and you don't really want to come back until, until that book is, is done. That does sound like just the book that, uh, that we need in this time. My guest on Gospel Bound has been Eric Larson. Uh, the book we've been discussing is The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill, family, and defiance during the Blitz. It is currently number one on the New York Times uh, hardcover nonfiction bestseller list. Congratulations on that, Eric. Thank you. And again, thank you for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thank you for having me. Delighted. Thanks for listening to this episode of Gospel Bound with Colin Hansen. Join us next time as we continue the search for firm faith in an anxious age. Visit tgc.org slash gospelbound to find transcripts and past episodes, subscribe to my newsletter, and suggest a guest or topic that will help you find hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ.